Hello, and welcome to the, our, the PGA conversation with the creative team behind One Night in Miami. We'd like to thank our friends at Amazon and Strategy PR for making this event possible. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator today. John Ridley is an Academy Award-winning screenwriter, director, novelist, playwright, and showrunner whose credits include 12 Years a Slave, Let It Fall, Los Angeles, 1982 through 1992, American Crime, and All is By My Side. The Other History of the DC Universe, a graphic miniseries he is writing for DC Comics, launched in November to critical acclaim. In the fall of 2018, Ridley opened No Studios, a space for the arts and community in his hometown of Mil Milwaukee. Very cool. So uh, welcome, John. Welcome, panelists. Thank you for being here. And please take it away. Well, thank you very much. I deeply appreciate it. And just very quickly to everyone who's watching, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're holding up as best you can. And I wish you all the best for the coming new year. Um, right now, I am incredibly blessed to be able to talk with the creative team behind an extraordinary film, which is called One Night in Miami. Joining us are uh, Kim Powers, who is the writer, producer of the film, uh, Jody Klein, producer, Keith and Jess Calder, also producers on the film, and director, producer, um, I just have to take a moment to really uh, introduce her properly. Her creative accomplishments and professional accomplishments are only, um, I think, overshadowed by who she is as an individual, as a professional partner, and just as a human and a friend. Uh, the remarkable Regina King, and I mean that from my heart. To all of you, how are you? I hope you're doing well. And more than anything, congratulations on an extraordinary film. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, We've got a lot to cover. We've only got a little bit of time to cover it. I wanna to talk to all of you, but look, I started as a writer, I'm a writer. I gotta to go to the writer first. <laughs> Kim, this is amazing. For people who don't know One Night in Miami, tell us what the story is. And also this started as a play. Talk about a little bit about that, its inception, what it is, and then let's talk about the transition from stage to screen. Sure, sure, thanks, thanks, John. Um, it, it, it almost started as a book, to be perfectly honest, because um, in my previous life, I was a journalist for 17 years. And that's when I first stumbled upon this, this, this real night. Um, February 25th, 1964, the night that Cassius Clay beat Sonny Liston. Um, of course, nobody expected the young 22-year-old upstart Clay to win. So there was no party planned. So in real life, he retreated to his friend Malcolm X's room, where he spent an evening in quiet conversation with Malcolm X, um, Sam Cooke, the singer, Jim Brown, the football player, and the next morning is when Cassius Clay announced to the media that he was a member of the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. So when I first discovered this, it was just a paragraph in a, a book I was reading on the intersection between civil rights and sports. Um, I was amazed. I mean, at the time that I read that paragraph, these were my Black Avengers. You know what I mean? Like these were literally the four icons who had being a generation Xer who had most shaped, you know, my thinking for various reasons. Um, so I started doing research with every intention on writing a book about the friendship between these four men in those years of roughly 1963 to 1965, um, when it, you know, when when they really intersect a lot with each other. And as fate would have it, um, right when my journalism career was evaporating, like so many others, as the journalism industry was contracting. Um, my nascent player at playwriting career was just starting. Um, I've been writing a lot of short plays. I never got around to writing the book, but I had years worth of research. So I was a member of a tiny <clears throat> equity waiver theater here in Los Angeles. And um, the artistic director asked if I had any ideas for a full length play. And I said, you know, there was this book I was gonna write, but I never got around to it because I couldn't quite get a lot of details about what they discussed that night. But I was like, it really makes a great subject for um, something theatrical, something on stage. Um, and so I, that's when I decided to write One Night in Miami as a stage play. Basically, it's, it's a work of fiction, but it's, it's, it's fiction powered by fact is the way I like to describe it. Using everything that I learned about each of these four men leading up to that night. And it was a crucible year for all four of those men. Right. You, you know, like, and, and that's, that's, I don't have, that's not Hollywood. That's just what happened. 
And knowing what happened to each of them right after that night, I felt it was a great gateway to have, honestly, and you know this, John, the conversation we've been having since W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington to today. What, if any, social responsibility do we as Black creatives have to our community? It's, it's an endless conversation. And I just wanted to kind of take this thing that goes on, I, I think, in a lot of our psyches and reverse engineer it into the mouths of the men that I think inspired that method of thinking. And that's how the play was born. Well, you, you talk about difficult conversations and exceptionally Black conversations. And some of those conversations you think, well, you know what, we don't know if these are going to translate in terms of entertainment. And I, I found this quote from Variety, which I think is very important for people to understand, not only what you did and how impactful it was. This is from Variety. It's easy to see why investors are saying this Cracker Jack world premiere is of value. Any playwright can stick celebrity facsimiles together in a room. It takes real talent. Let me just read that again. It takes real talent to not only render those portraits believable, but also in the best in these counters with dramatic weight. You write this play, it comes out, it, it not only works on the page, it, it, it works in terms of delivering what you wanna do. So you have this amazing play. Where's, this, where's that transition then from what's working on the stage to how do we make this into a movie? Jody, I think you were next coming in as a producer. How did the two of you come together and Kim, for you, having this incredibly personal piece, what made Jody the right person to say, I, I'm going to trust this individual to help me get it from the stage to wherever it's going to live next? Well, I'm going to let Jody start this story because it's. I want to see how much of the story he tells you because it's a funny fucking story. <laughs> <laughs> Take away, Jody. All right, with that build up, um, I get a call. Uh, that there's this uh, production taking place in California. I'm East Coast based and it had four characters. And one of the characters was Sam Cooke. We look after some of uh, Sam, Sam Cooke's assets and, and work with the estate. And I check with my licensing department to see if there's any music that had been licensed and none had been licensed. So I said, there's a play with Sam Cooke in it and there's no music, jump on a plane, go see the, the, the play. Next day, I got Kemp's number, called him. We met for lunch. Um, and, you know, the play has, has Sam Cooke's music all over it. It's, it's integral to the story. It. A lot of it. And Kemp uh, um, starts off by saying, you know, how, how, it, how he's a nobody, how it's his first play. And if it, uh, if it didn't do well, it would go away in three days and there wouldn't be a problem. And then he said, without skipping a beat, and if it was good, I figured you'd call me. And then it, at that point, I reached over the table and shook his hand and I said, hello, partner. And then we ended up producing it in you know, several continents, uh, uh, you know, in from, from uh, United States to the UK, to South Africa. Um, and because of the, the accolades that we were getting, the um, uh, Hollywood came a calling, and they all had their great ideas about how to uh, bring this to the screen. And I said, "Well, that's great." Spoke to Kemp. Kemp, you know, had an idea of how to do it, so went back to the well, and he came up with the uh, uh, with the screenplay. And then at that point, I went back to Hollywood and was. Uh, confused to say the least. Uh, and talk yes, about that a little bit, though. You were confused. What was confusing you? What was what was the concerns? Um, everybody uh, was a hundred percent sure they knew how to transition it to the mm. to the screen. And in transitioning, they were watering it down, mm. and that was the problem. And what what drew me to to camp in the beginning was. Um, the, the authenticness of the dialogue and of the characters. Um, and while we were putting on the productions, these wonderful people kept following me around going, hey, we'd like to make a movie out of it and, uh, and adapt it. And we talked and talked and 
the next thing that happened, Keith and Jess came into my life. Interesting. So Keith and Jess, you, you, you're following this production around like it was the Grateful Dead, you know, performing <laughs> at the height of their careers. What was it that, you know, look, we, we, we know it's powerful. We know it's a story that needs to be told. But for the two of you, out of anything that you could have been chasing at this point, what was it about this show that you said, this is something that we've got to make into a film? I mean, I, I, for us, I think we're very drawn to um, what we feel passionately about. Like, I think, I think that we, we are, we're very, um, Jess and I both are very uh, all-consuming producers. Like, if we're making something, we're, we're very much all in. Um, and so for us, it needs to be something we really care about in order to, to know that we're going to do that. Um, we were lucky enough to see the original production of the play here in LA and just fell in love with it. And I think we called Kemp pretty much the next day. I mean, it was, it was after seeing it, we, we figured out how to reach out to him and, and, and said how much we loved it and how we felt like there's, there's a movie there and, um, and started kind of talking about different ideas of what that could be. And he said, but you know, my partner on this is Jody. You got to talk to Jody. And then we started a sort of multi-year yeah. romance, I would say. <laughs> We're very good at stalking, is kind of what I'm, I'm a very good stalker. There's a right uh, way and there's a wrong way. And you guys- Yeah, yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. I feel like in the romantic exactly. comedy sense of stalking, where it's like, yeah. it all ends so far for us. With it's a happy, happy ending, ending stalking, happy not, ending. Not, not, not sad. Fatal not fatal yeah, yeah. <laughs> But good. to their credit, what I loved about what Keith and Jess did was like every year they would produce some other film and then they would reach out. Like I remember when Anomalisa got nominated for the Oscar and you guys reached out and were like, so we got an Oscar nomination. I think Jody is down to do the One Night in Miami movie now. Or like you did, but like every time they would do another movie, they would then follow up by reaching out and saying, hey, look what we just did. So you guys ready to do this One Night in Miami movie? And it yeah. was like a, every single year for what, six years maybe, five years? I think it, it wasn't quite that long, but it, it felt like that long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think when we, yeah. we, did, yeah. we did a movie called Blind Spotting, and, and before it came out, we invited Jody to come watch a screening of it. And I think, I think post that screening was sort of when- um, We shook hands. Yeah. We shook hands and became partners, and then came up with this brilliant idea that there was only one person to direct it. Exactly. Listen, I, what I appreciate is what I'm hearing from you all in terms of producers, in terms of working mm -hmm. together as a team thus far, is there's so much of it built on trust. There was very, it seems like there was yeah. very little built on, yeah, but what's the deal? Um, what are you offering me? Yeah. I, I love, Kim, when you talk about, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little guy, but I'm doing something honorific. And if somebody really cares about it, they'll come to this. I appreciate that. You've got pretty much everything. You've got producers, you've got a great script. You got people who are passionate about it. You got the music. There's one piece missing when we're transitioning to a film. That's the director. There's a lot of folks you could go to. You've gone to somebody who my admiration for is off the charts. How? What made you think, and certainly there are any number of things, but out of all the people you could possibly go to, Regina King is the individual. I mean, we all discussed internally <laughs> different, <laughs> different director ideas. And I think that that um, Regina's name kept coming up. And I honestly, I can't remember who first brought it up, but I think we all sort of were aware that Regina um, was looking for a movie. And I think because Regina was telling people she was looking for a movie. Uh, <laughs> and then um, we were familiar with her work directing in, in television and, and felt like um, she had a, a voice that that is hard to express in the schedule of television, that especially episodic rather than the pilot. And I felt like, um, you know, obviously her 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 magnificent scope of work as an actor and and as a leader, uh, I think were were big attractions. And and we reached yeah. out. You know, it was right around it was right around the time when Regina gave that incredible speech um, uh, at the Golden Globes, like challenging. Uh, all, all of us to step up. And I think with, when we saw that, like that crystallized everything, like it can only be, be her because she is literally doing everything that Kemp is talking about in that play. Yeah. Um, and she was kind enough to carve out time in her incredibly busy schedule to even meet with us during that, that, that time. I think we met right in between the Oscar, I mean, right in between the, the Golden Globes and the Oscars, which 
when I think about it now, now knowing her, I'm like, I don't, yeah, where how did does she find in? the time? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> um, yeah. There are, and I do want to pivot to Regina, and I mean this sincerely, fewer harder working individuals. When I say harder working, all the work that we do is hard. But Regina, one of the things that I really admire about you, and as we um, talk about you directing, when I got to know you, you said, you know, part of what you really want to do is, is, is take more ownership of stories and direct. And I've worked with writers who want to direct, actors who want to direct, DPs who want to direct, um, editors who want to direct. And there's a lot of us, and I put myself into it, it's like, okay, I just want to direct. You, I have had the opportunity to witness you putting in the work on the floor, looking at the page, doing all of those things um, to make sure that when you got an opportunity like this, you were absolutely ready. But I would love to hear from you when this script or story or the approach, what were the things that you thought both on the page, but also knowing what it takes to, um, you know, to, to make any production work, looking at it and saying, I can do this. I know you can do anything, but there are those choices where, hey, the, the budget, the material, all of that is gonna match what needs to be done to really express these four amazing men in history. Well, uh, it's funny hearing everyone's um, story of how this all came to be. It's always interesting to hear it and hear the things that differ slightly. Um, I am totally flattered that you guys were having conversations and, you know, kind of landed on me, but that's not how I received it. <laughs> you know, um, and, and I think, you know, to my agent's credit, Harley, um, I think probably it was smart if that was how the conversations between um, Keith and Jess and Harley kind of came to be, he didn't reveal that. So he definitely made it very uh, clear to me that, you know, I needed to get the job, you know, and, and he felt very strongly about this particular project because he and I just had a meeting not long before where I told him I really wanted to do um, a love story with an historical backdrop. Now, while I, while I was talking about more of a romance with with black with the black uh, couple as as the you know focal point, and um, while I was talking about romance, uh, I think Harley, uh, being a lover of film as all of us, um, knew when he read Kemp's piece that it did exactly do that. It is a um, a love story, if you will. And when I read it, I received it as a, a, a love story, a love letter to black men. Mm -hmm. And I felt like this conversation is a very private conversation that can happen in a public way. It's a conversation as Kim pointed out earlier that has been happening forever. Mm -hmm. these, these men are men that are you know, icons, they're, they're larger than life to all of us across the, the world, globally, you know? Um, and um, I feel like I, as an audience member, I don't get the opportunity to watch the men that I know and love depicted in this way, as complex, as, as, as having actually had experiences that formed why they are where they are in a moment. And because this is not, Kemp made a great decision to not make this to Cassius Clay, Malcolm X, Jim Brown, or Sam Cooke story, but to make it this slice of life, I felt like when reading it, he was able to really humanize people that we, like I said, look at as like gods, but also um, create this parallel between the, uh, the uh, nation guards that are standing at the door uh, uh, guarding Malcolm to uh, Cassius. You know, like there, there, is a, there is a through line that every black man um, understands in, in a really deep way, understands that you know, getting on the elevator, putting on your talisman to make white people on the elevator comfortable. 
Yeah. You know, those things, all of those men, no matter how much money you make or how high your cachet is or how much cachet you have, as a black man, you understand that. And so that on the page jumped out at me. And then the actor in me, this is an actor's piece. And if you're gonna come out the gate on your first one, play to your strengths, girl. You know, and you know, acting is, is something that uh, I think I'm pretty good at. I'm not, I'm not so bad <laughs> at and, and And I would wanna play any of those roles. And I knew that the star is the dialogue to me. The star mm -hmm. of this film was Kemp's words. You know, I knew very early on, this wasn't, while Sam's music is throughout, I did not want music to step on any of these words. These words are so important. And I felt like a great actor, it's gonna, great, four great actors are gonna know that they have to embody who these men are, opposed to impersonate these men. And, yep. and because the words are there, they just will bring them the life, the, the, the right actors. Yeah, there's a moment uh, early on in this film um, that I thought was brilliant. I'm not gonna give it away. Uh, it's with the amazing Bo Bridges. And I'll be honest, I'm watching this with my wife and we're going, oh, okay, well, this is a more pleasant film than I was expecting. And you all do something, again, I'm not gonna give this away, where I'm like, okay, this is real. This film is real. That moment in particular, you know, I, I wanted, to, as we pivot to talking about production, I don't know, I haven't had the opportunity to see the play, but you know, you're talking about a stage play, you know, on a stage, largely for men. And now this film breathes because you're on roads in the deep South. You're, as I said, in London or in, in the UK boxing. Talk about that transition and those choices knowing you're gonna open this film up and you're at the Fountain Blue Hotel. You know, you, you, you are at the Tonight Show. You're all over the place. And I don't mean in a scattered way. This film breathes, but you know, I, I, I in, take this as a compliment. Couldn't tell you the price point. Couldn't tell you, it just breathes. Talk about that transition. Talk about producerially those choices you made and how you had to make them. And then more importantly, how you pulled them off. Well, well, we could feel the price point. <laughs> we felt it. Yeah. I, I will say that. I mean, um, as as everyone on this call, and and you know, most everyone watching that you know blesses us with their eyes and ears for this moment, understands that you know you you you, ha you come to something with you know big ideas and big thoughts and with independent film and just as time is going as the time progresses you realize okay we're not okay we're not it's not going to be that okay right. it's not going to be the fountain blue lobby it's going to be the fountain blue room okay you know so there there there's certain um we we came with uh big expectations and we um I just have to say this relationship has been absolutely the most amazing because of the trust that mm -hmm. we've had between each other and the honesty that we've shared along the way that we were able to um, collectively decide where we're gonna shoot, spend more money and where we're gonna take it away. And, and those were difficult decisions to make, especially, you know, as a director, you know, you want everything right. um, in there. But, you know, again, I can't say this enough. It started on the page and Kim's understanding that it did have to open up. Um, and, and I'm sure that those were conversations that were happening before I came on board, but the understanding of that the way he decided to open it up outside the room did something else as far as storytelling and not just to open it up on a visual uh, level, but to humanize the men. When you meet each of them, you are meeting them as they're getting kicked in the gut. Right. And, and that immediately takes the Cassius, Malcolm, Jim, Sam out of it and makes them just men. And, and, he did that while opening it up, visual, letting it breathe visually. So I just. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's, look, uh, again, I said, it's uh, the whole point of this room is it's supposed to be a crucible moment. 
Um, I was really, in, in order to get to the essence of what made the play special, I had to let go of a lot of stuff that was in the play. Um, it, it's interesting when you watch the film, I didn't even realize it until like really watching it. I'm like, oh, you don't get to a single line from the play until like 45 minutes into this movie. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I think it was very important to, to again, show each of these men, as I say, take an L leading up to this, just to show, tease that vulnerability, just because of where they are. They were such a, on, on the night that this happened, I mean, if you coincidentally, and this is from the stage play, one of the props on the, the table was a co the cover of Ebony Magazine from that month. And it was like, Jim Brown, the most powerful man on earth. It was just the, the way that people were even describing that like Sam Cooke, um, I, I don't think people of my generation necessarily understand Sam Cooke's impact on, on popular music. You, you know what I mean? Like on, like it's, it's really, really something. I mean, him and Saw Records predated Motown. Um, and, and so he was, he was revolutionizing. It was interesting when I watched the film Ray and a big plot point in Ray was that he had, he had his masters and it's like, yeah, he learned that from Sam Cooke because Sam Cooke was the guy who's like, get your goddamn masters, you know? He was the guy who cared about publishing and writing and all those things like that. That was a very Sam Cooke thing. That's why Ray Charles sang at Sam Cooke's funeral. He, he inspired people in a way that I think a lot of us don't realize. And about, so I wanted to show these powerful men the, the crack in their armor um, leading up to the night. Um, and, and I think that the, the wonderful thing about losing some of the best moments of the play, like if you, for fans of the play, the most show-stopping moment is Sam performing live at the Harlem Square Club. That's not even in the movie. Mm -hmm. So, but, it, but, but that moment did not serve the story we were trying to tell in the film. Whereas a moment like um, the, the, the moment with Bo Bridges that you mentioned absolutely does. That moment doesn't exist that way in the play. In the play, it's like Jim is telling a story and it doesn't hit you the same way. So when it came time to pick a, one of, it was basically four prologues. And with the other three guys, there were very obvious things that happened to each of them in their lives. Cassius did almost get knocked out by Henry Cooper. Sam right. had bombed at the Copa, you know? Like, but with Jim, it was like, well, he just came off of like another NFL record. There's nothing. And it was like, oh, that moment where despite being invincible, there's a demarcation line that he still right. can't cross. And for a man like that who can't be touched physically to have to grind his teeth through that humiliation is every bit as bad as Ali getting knocked out or Sam getting booed at the Copa. So that's, that's really what it was for, was for me, just you know, trying to let people understand that we were going to see these men in a way you've never seen them before. You know, you, you mentioned something, Kemp, and I want to put this question to everybody, and I want to put it in two ways. You talk about um, folks of your generation maybe not being aware of, of certain things. I'm certainly not a kid anymore, but I don't, you know, I'm aware of these guys, but certainly the intimate details, or at least these conversations, I wasn't aware of. So on two levels, how do you as producers we're talking about material or circumstances. My math is horrible. More than 50 years ago, both in terms of the visual, because there are style points in production and wardrobe, uh, you know, just even Malcolm talking very specifically about his camera that he loves so much that you all clearly paid very much attention to. So there's that from a producerial standpoint, but also from a writer director standpoint, you're working with very young actors, but young relative to me young actors who are asked to embody some of the most iconic, not just black men, men in history. So if you can just talk and you can, and I put this to everyone, but talking in two spaces, writer, director, and producers about taking material from 50 years ago and making it visually as specific as you did. And then emotionally for young people, both who are performing and for my kids who go, hey, it's time for you two to come down and watch something because this is going to matter to you. Talk about those things if you can. Any, to, to any of you. I could talk about some of the visual approach, which is that one, one of the things that we had, um, we, we had a very short pre-production period on this film, but we had a very long pre-pre-production period because we were all doing other things and we kind of knew there was a period of time in the future we are gonna make the movie. So there definitely were a lot of, talks that we could have internally about 
photography references from the period, like things that 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 felt like they were capturing the spirit of what the the movie could be. Um, and I think a lot of that were were. I mean, I think Regina can probably talk to some of that in more specifics. But I, I think that there is a rich. Um, even though it's a long time ago, before I was born, for sure, there's a there's a rich visual catalog, some of which is very well known, and some of which is is less known that we were able to kind of dig into and 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 get information from. Um, and I think, you know, it helps that well, Regina can obviously get into this more detail too. But I think there were were people that were around then, or relatives of people that were around then, or things like that 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 we had access to really in large part because of Regina that were able to kind of give information that helped inform the reality of that of that story. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I keep going back to Kemp. You know, he, okay. Kemp was just a wealth of, of, of information because he had done so much research because obviously the intention was to write a book at first. Yeah. So um, I think uh, by the time I came into it and pulling the pictures that I was pulling, I think only a few of them were pictures that you guys weren't like, oh yeah, we haven't seen that one. But you know, Kemp had already the, turned over every uh, image that there was possible. But in those pre-production -pre stages, there were a lot of conversations that Kemp and I were having, just getting on the same page. Because first and foremost, he's my first audience. I, I, I'm, I'm directing this film for him. I want him to like it and feel like he sees himself in it. So that was happening. And then we were flying from uh, New York, Oakland, LA. I was in Atlanta and we were meeting and starting to just in New Orleans and, and starting to just create our tone. It was very loose, but, but very purpose. And um, I think around in that time uh, before we started meeting with DPs, I think I, I was expressing to them, I want this film to have color. Mm -hmm. I want it to be, be, be it, color represents black people to me, you know, with our history in our relationship to America, everything that's happened, we still find a way to smile, dance, laugh, love, look good in our clothes. You know, when you look at pictures in the 60s, it could be people that um, were not from, you know, really from a lot of means and they still look good. They still had a swag to them. And so that was really, I wanted to capture that because in my opinion, that is the thing, you know, John, when you talk about your, um, your children, you know, while there are a lot of films out there that have a more muted tone that I, that I love, I don't think it grabs the 20 somethings in and, and, and this, I want those men, I want my son, I want your son to see yeah. themselves and, and be pulled in so that they can listen to these words and listen to the fact that in 1964, these men who our kids love, by the way, um, were feeling some of the same things that they were feeling, they're feeling. And I also think with our kids, because Kemp also has a, a, a son, um, um, a daughter of, of the same age, uh, and that they are feeling a lot of the things that are discussed but don't really know how to articulate it or don't, don't really know what it is. But they know they're feeling some bit of this inherited uh, pain and, um, and, and, and marginalization. They, 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 they know they're feeling it, just yeah. can't, can't necessarily uh, articulate what it is. And I feel like visuals uh, you know, th five minutes. If we don't get them in five minutes, right. you know, that's it. So I, I felt color was 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 important, and 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 you know, uh, everyone supported me on that. And, and I'm I'm so glad you brought up the young people too, because I, I mean, every a lot of people don't know this, but when I wrote the play, I told everyone who would listen that I wrote the play for young adults. 
mm. you know, because of the language, you know, and obviously this is a rated R film, because of the language, people assume that it's not for young people. And I'm like, well, I guess I just grew up seeing rated R movies. So, but for me, it was always meant for, I said, my 19 year old self, who I felt like, I wish I could have seen this story when I was 19 years old. And that's why one of the reasons I feel like we're so lucky that we did this film independently, because I think I've said multiple times to other folks here that one of my favorite films when I was a kid was The Outsiders, Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsiders. And I said, everyone in The Outsiders within five years was an A-list star. And I was like, my dream for this film is like, can we do something like that? Whereas instead of the agents telling us which A-list client will deign to like spend five minutes, we just go out and cast for talented people who are just excellent at their craft. And, and if everyone doesn't know them, that's fine. Let this be the, 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 the performance that if, if they aren't already can help put them on the map. And, and I think that at the very least, no one can argue that we succeeded with that because this ensemble has, has just like, they put their foot way up in their, their roles in a way that I think shocked a lot of people. Performances were outstanding. And one of the things that I really appreciated in taking away from this film, you know, I obviously I could not help but watch this film as a black man of a certain age. But at the same time, there were themes about individuality and choices and responsibility that are applicable to anyone in any space. One of the reasons that I have to assume that, of course, the words on the page, but I really appreciate looking at you as a producerial team. You look like America. You look like the world. You look like people who are going to take themes that to some people may feel like, well, it's a black film. Well, it's a guy's film. This is a people's film. And just as we wrap, I would really like to hear from all of you. And I, and I want to start with you, Jody. Um, what it is, more than anything, that you want people to take away from this film. And I'll just say very quickly, I think this is a perfect film for imperfect times. But within that, there's so much to take away. So Jody, for you, you know, what, when people watch this film, beyond being amazed at everything that was done, um, the production values, the precision, emotionally, what do you want people to take away from this? Before, before I answer that, I do want to give one more shout out to Kemp, because you have to remember, this was written almost a decade ago, mm. okay? And it resonates back then as it does today. So that's something for all of us to think about um, when you watch it. And, and one of the things that I think people do take away from it is the discussion. Mm -hmm. It's like, you've heard these guys talking about um, events that affect them. And, and it's okay to talk about it because that's the only way we are going to move on. So I think the discussion is what I want people to take away hmm. and an understanding. Uh, Keith and Jess, for you. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I'm just gonna take this back to the, the, the first time that I saw the play, which is, um, you know, is one of those, those days that I think we've all had um, when it, it hasn't been a great day. And then, and then you're told, well, there's this little tiny play uh, that you should go check check out. And LA theater kind of doesn't always have the best reputation. So you're thinking, oh, okay. Enough get, said. Do I have to go? I think, I don't know. And then um, all of that, you're sitting down and within moments, I was just captured but by what Kemp had, had written and by the actors in that play. And by the time that that play was, was over, there was tears in my eyes and I was just so moved by everything that I was feeling and by everything that transpired on, on, that, on that stage. But more than anything, um, and we talk about this a lot as a group, um, I felt like an overwhelming sense of being called to to action mm. of being like of, of all of those men and um telling me like well this is what we did but what what are you going to do now with 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 your life and um now knowing everything that that we talked about and um for me i just in translating it to the film mm. 
the most important thing for me was to try to make sure that that call to action can spread as far as possible and, and people watch it and hear the words and, and are moved in that same way that I was in that tiny little theater all, all those years ago. And Kemp, for you? I mean, it's twofold. I mean, one, I, I really, really um, believe that young people need to be given the keys to the car. And all these great movements have always been youth movements. I really hope that people are reminded watching this that these men accomplished these great things, but they were still young men doing it. Mm. And they made mistakes. And at times, they didn't know what the fuck they were doing because that's <laughs> humanity. Um, and that's me. I was older the day that I wrote this play than all four men were that night. Mm. And that really, really says something about our perception of these great men and the reality of it, which is that they were young men feeling their way around, taking chances. And I hope it encourages a young generation to take those same chances again, because I think they're the only way that we'll ever be able to move forward. That's beautiful. And Regina, for you? Of course, you're supposed to do Kemp last. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> you're the director now. Everybody plays their part. You are the director. Uh -huh. um, I mean, I feel, uh, you know, what everyone has said, um, I guess really on a personal level, I, I want, again, every black man that I know and love, every black man that I don't know and love to see themselves in this piece. I want them to take that away and, and just kind of on uh, expanding on what Kemp was saying that, um, to, to see that these men that are so great, how young they were and how they in moments didn't know the answer, didn't know if it was the right choice and that it inspires them to, um, you know, perhaps make a mistake, but make a mistake from a place of integrity. Cause that's one thing I feel like all four of them um, have in spades. Uh, was integrity even even you know when you see them uh as brothers in in some of these moments you know checking each other on their shit you yeah. know and and you know it's almost like summer camp you know you fight but then you leave you know with your arms around each other and ready for you know the next year you know um so i i guess uh, i i i hope for that and um I hope that also people can take away the fact that can take away with the understanding, and this is building on what Jess said, that the call to action part of it, that, you know, not to, you know, no pun intended, but as Donald, this is America mm -hmm. and it hasn't changed much. And we all have to take responsibility in the America that we are in right now. And, you know, uh, whether it's because you haven't, uh, said anything or you haven't done something, use your voice in some way. Sure, some of us have bigger platforms than others, but your voice in some way to um, to change what that fabric is. You know, we always talk about the fabric of America, but we don't talk about the history that's been revised. We don't talk about um, the the I mean, not to end this on a, a dark note, but this is actually not a dark note. It's a, it's a positive thing for me. All of the contributions that black people made, you know, like we, so many people would be dead if there weren't, if it wasn't for Dr. Drew, if the, Charles Drew, so many, you know what I mean? Like, right. and we, we wouldn't have freaking printers if it wasn't for, um, I can't remember her name, but. Uh, who invented that printer. So there's so many things that um, the world, the America that we love today is because of something a black person discovered or a black body that built it. Right. Um, so I want people to leave this and want to do research if they right. didn't know. Well, Regina, I don't think that's a heavy note at all because I think the call to action, and as you say, we do it in different spaces, but I appreciate genuinely for all of you 
is that you did not wait for other people's permission to make this film happen. And as I said, this is a perfect film for imperfect times. The humanity, the love, the respect, the nuance, it's there every single moment in this film. The film is One Night in Miami. It is gonna start streaming on Amazon on January 15th. Um, my congratulations to all of you. The best during the season, just as people, the best during the awards season. I know it's incredibly competitive, but what you have all put together, um, you again, don't need anybody's permission to be proud of what you've all accomplished. Thank you so much for taking the time today, for joining us, for talking about this film. For everybody who was watching, thank you for taking the time. Again, stay safe, be well, be healthy. My best to each and every one of you for the coming year. Thank you very much and have a great, great day. Thank you. Thanks John. a lot, John. Thank you. Appreciate it.